What's up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy. Thanks for joining me today in another podcast episode. I'm excited that you're here. If you haven't liked us, please do so. Share this with a friend. Give us a subscribe. Leave a comment. All those, all the things help us out. But we're excited that you're here and joining us again. Um, you know, and we're here to help you. If you're studying to do uh, to get your professional engineering license. We're here to help you every step of the way. Check us out, civilengineeringacademy.com. But today my guest is Dr. Nehemiah Mabry. He goes by Dr. Nee, and he is awesome. He is a structural engineer. He's earned his PhD uh, from North Carolina State. Uh, he works as a bridge engineer or part-time now, but definitely was working as, a, as an engineer in the structural engineering world, uh, doing bridge design, bridge inspections, and all that fun stuff. He has since be, uh, you know, started a company called STEM Media, and it's been a few years now that he's been running it, but STEM Media is built around helping underrepresented groups be able to find you know, STEM and encourage STEM and finding a leg up in STEM through networking and courses and through media. Uh, so STEM media is really his uh, bread and butter and uh, something he created. And it is an awesome resource for people that are finding their way into STEM. So we talk all about his journey into civil engineering, talk about any issues that he had, successes and some failures. He gives some great tips along the way. I really enjoyed this interview. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it as well. And it's going to be coming up right after this. See you in a minute. All right, we are live. Dr. Nee, thanks for jumping on the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. I appreciate you being here today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. These are always fun to do. You know, I, I connected with you just kind of uh, over the internet and the mission you guys have going on. And I really like what I'm seeing. And I just wanted to bring you on the show and talk about not only that, but your own kind of history into engineering as well. Get sure. a little bit about your background. So I guess... As we kick this thing off, um, can you tell me just a little bit more about your own background in engineering? Why why did you choose that path yourself? Uh, how did you get here? Yeah, how did I get here? That's a good question, man. I tell you what, my 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 dad always gets the credit for that. He recommended engineering to me. Um, I heard the word a number of times. Of course, I I knew that the person who directed or drove the train was called an engineer. <laughs> Uh, that, of course, that's a common thought. You always get that. Yeah. Always. And I tell you that uh, it wasn't until 11th grade that I actually got introduced to what it really was. My, my dad recommended I I went off of this NASA summer internship program. Mm. Um, I applied for it, got in, loved it, loved it a whole lot. And um, for once, my dad was right. For once, he knew something, right? <laughs> uh, so I got in and did that. So much so, I'm going to tell you that the next uh, summer, I finished this internship they didn't have it for me that year it was uh i was between high school and college i just volunteered i said hey can i come out and do it again can you put me in the lab I i'll do whatever i just want to continue to be around this phenomenal engineering that's taking place out here on the uh, on the marshall space flight center wow. uh, location there in huntsville alabama and you know the rest was history i, I got another internship the following year and just stay with NASA, I think, for a total of about eight plus years. Wow. Do various uh, part time jobs and internships. That's great. Now, fast forward, and you've got your PhD, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your doctor. And I know going into STEM is, is a, it can be a difficult career path. Yeah. So, how did you, what motivated you to go in, uh, all the way to get your doctorate degree? How, what was the decision behind that? Yeah, I wish I would say that. Hey, I knew ever since I was a kid I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to come down. I, I didn't. I didn't even plan on getting my PhD when I was doing my bachelor's. Yeah, and I, I graduated when it was, you know, the Great Recession. That was mm -hmm. that was when I came out of undergrad. And in my mind, I would just get a nice little job and um start working down there in Alabama. But since I went to a number of uh, job fairs and I found out that even the recruiters at the job fairs <laughs> weren't a hundred percent confident in their own jobs. I'd say, you know what, maybe there's an opportunity to stay in school a little bit longer and ride mm -hmm. this thing out a bit. Um, but here's how the opportunity really came. I saw someone in the cafeteria it was at a restaurant who happened to be working on the same internship program that I did when I was in high school. So by this time we're about five, six years down the road. And I run into someone that I met my first year at NASA. And they say, you know, here there's another program. Uh, that is targeting grad students. It's called the NASA Graduate 
student research program. Hmm. If you apply for that, you will have funding to stay in school and receive a stipend. And would you know that I applied for that? I stayed in school and I uh, took two years to get a master's degree. And it wasn't until after the master's degree that they said, hey, we got one more year worth of funding. I think it was up to three years of funding. If you stay in one more year and at least start your PhD, we can get you started. And it was at that point that I really made the decision to say, hey, why don't this go all the way? You know, I was wow. out of the master's. And so uh, I just kept walking as the doors continued to open. That's great. You know, I, I see a lot of engineers that always question whether they should go that far or not. Yeah. Do you have any tips or advice whether they should go that far? Is it yeah, a benefit sure. to them? Or is it a career choice? What What's your thoughts around that? Yeah, so so the master's is different from the PhD in terms of its value. I think that the master's in some cases can give you uh, a little bit of a boost in terms of your earning potential there mm-hmm. in industry. Um, however, PhD is not... It's not something you do just because. <laughs> and I look at it all the time. I make a joke and say, if I had to do it all over again, uh, I don't know if I would do it all over again. No, <laughs> that's kind of what I say. But, uh, you know, I, it was definitely valuable to me. But here's my advice. You know, know your why. Know why you want to do it to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, just simply being called doctor. I mean, that's cool. That's cute and all. But you could find yourself missing out on a lot of parts of life and You know, you could really be studying, doing research that perhaps isn't even something that you want to continue doing uh, throughout the four, five, six or more years that it takes to get that doctorate degree. So I would say if you can identify what you want to do, is it research? Uh, Do you want to be a professor one day? Uh, Do you want to work in a part of industry that allows you to be on the cutting, bleeding edge of technology and innovation? You know, if you can identify those types of things as your reasoning, then sure, yeah, continue on. Because it is indeed a persistence game, not so much about being smart enough. Right. A lot of people could do it. You just have to persist. And the thing that helps you to persist, the difference, right? Let me say it this way. The difference between it being, um, you know, unbearable and downright torture. (laughs) Now, hear what I said. It's going to be unbearable at times, period. But (laughs) to make it not torture is by at least having a, a why and a purpose for what you're doing. I like that. Yeah, I noticed. I mean, when I when I was in school, I definitely had to lean on that, and it always helped uh, when you had other people you could lean on too. And usually, sure. you have a good support group. You know, if you can find yeah. people you're studying with, or even counselors or whatnot, you know, people yeah. you can lean on that'll help you get get through those challenging times because it can be a challenge. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that that kind of leads me to another question: Is a big part of your mission is being able to encourage underrepresented groups to go into to STEM. Yeah. So knowing that this is kind of a, like a challenging career path and whatnot, how do you, how do you get groups uh, joining? What, what's been, uh, how are you able to, how are you able to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So I I brought up my father earlier and Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I found out that he actually started engineering when he was in undergrad, he started when he was in college, but he didn't finish. And it wasn't because he wasn't intelligent. In fact, he actually went back to school later on in his 50s and finished his engineering degree. But it, as he said it, as he would say it, and I found firsthand from those who started with me and didn't finish, mm-hmm. it is more about having a sense of belonging, being able to see yourself in this world when it gets challenging. And being an underrepresented minority, numerically speaking, being someone who isn't, um, you know, represented in the traditional presentations of the field and things of that nature, you can often kind of doubt your own your own sufficiency, your own uh, fitting, right? Yeah, and so I often can times, see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're oftentimes it's a matter of creating an image, creating a vision for others to be able to see themselves in it. And so as I look at my career and the things I do personally, as well as my organization, STEM Media, mm-hmm. the goal is to really change the perception of what STEM success looks like. What does engineering look like? And I think it is a place that is broad enough where one can be their authentic self. They can express themselves culturally, whether it be the way they dress, the way they talk, uh, or what have you, um, and still be very uh, effective, right, in the field. Still be an engineer. Still yep. be an engineer, right? And I try to create that so that in, to a certain degree, uh, people can borrow a vision yeah. until, until they can have one of their own. 
Well, yeah, I, I think you are a perfect example. And when people see you and what you're doing, um, I love, I love what you said, borrow someone else's vision. When I think when they see you're doing it, they know they can do it too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's so many analogies to that. Who was the person that broke the, uh, what was it? The six minute mile. No one thought you could ever do that. And then they did it. And I was like, now everyone can do it. Nothing. So. Right. Right. <laughs> it's easy. Well, I love it. So, um, why don't you tell me a little bit more about, uh, STEM media, what, what you do with that and what, what its mission is. Absolutely. So STEM media, I'm the CEO and founder of STEM media, and our mission is to elevate and empower unrealized STEM success. So STEM media is an ed tech and media company that focuses on community uh, content and career development, predominantly for young professionals in steel and STEM, you know, about mm -hmm. 18, 18, 35, who are also uh, black, indigenous and people of color. So while not exclusively, we do have a special interest in making sure those who are, again, as I mentioned, underrepresented to broaden participation, also another way of stating it, for people who have the ability, who have the potential, um, but can use additional support simply by, again, presenting it in a, in a different way. Uh, that being said, I really feel like the world is missing out, right? Mm -hmm. Human potential is not fully realized right. because we don't have the inclusion that we need because of the brilliance and the genius that comes from having a more diverse team isn't always accounted for. And so STEM media likes to be one who on one hand creates the content, creates the material, creates the programming that allows things to be explored in a non-traditional manner. Um, but also we're a platform that helps to connect, you know, recruiters and talent acquisition folks and people who are actually looking to, be, looking to be exposed and to access more diverse pool of talent as well. And so we do that, again, as a service-based company in media production, but also as a platform. We have an app. Uh, we host wow. our own events, and we allow some of those incidental collisions to take place under the, the, within the, the media ecosystem. That's great, man. I, I really do enjoy you know, what I've learned about STEM media and what you guys are doing. So uh, I think it's awesome. Um, lo love what you're doing. What do you think, I guess, now that you've been doing it for a little while, uh, what's been your favorite part about running STEM media? Ooh, that's a good question. Cause there's a lot of good parts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's nothing like having a creative idea and things that sometimes are feel very authentic. They feel very true to who you are, but you just haven't seen it been done before. You haven't seen someone mix, say spoken word poetry with, you know, technical concepts, you right? Know, like, <laughs> people, you know, mix you know, have a DJ in the middle of a professional development workshop. Like <laughs> that isn't always the case. Right. And when we do these things, but, and yet find that they not only um, culturally resonate with people, but still people walk away um, empowered, enlightened and um, advanced in their career. That, that there's nothing more, more and, and awake. Keep and me awake. awake. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, recommending it to other people. Right. That's what we do. And uh, yeah, that's one of the best parts. And then, you know, it's always cool to just ideate with my team, you sit down and say, oh, you know, we want to make a video that does this and this. What are all the ways we can do this and this in a video? And so we come up with it and the next thing you know, we're shooting it, editing it, and that's putting it awesome. out to the world. Oh, I love it. I, I think it's good, good stuff. Um, that, that must be really fun to see that happen. I'm also curious on the flip side of things, what, like, what's been your biggest challenge running mm. STEM media? Like, like what's, what's keeping you up at night? What's something that's on your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, right now we, I feel like it's really a moment in time with converging trends, right? You got, of course, the fact that about 70% of our GDP as a country is tied directly to STEM talent. Mm -hmm. uh, then you look at what COVID accelerated what we're already headed towards, and that is increasingly digital and remote education and engagement of mm -hmm. people in STEM, right? And then obviously, because of unfortunate things that have happened, people are starting to see that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only the right thing to do, but people are also starting to see that it's good for the bottom line. It's actually making a difference. So mm -hmm. these things are sort of conversion, and I feel like really create an opportunity for STEM media and other people who are mission aligned to really make a difference. That being said, um, what keeps me up is this window passing. This window passing and not really be able to fully capitalize on it because of the fact that maybe, you know, um, the resources aren't there, you know, to really go mm -hmm. at full speed or um, 
there being perhaps some things in me or my personal life or not being able to link up with the right people. Like I, I think this is a uh, an opportunity for us to really, really push humanity forward by capitalizing on these trends. Um, and we have to take the opportunity of the lifetime within the lifetime of the opportunity. And that's that's really what keeps me up at night. Wow. That is a lot to unpack, man. I, <laughs> that, that is a, a challenge. Um, yeah, I, I think COVID and all, you know, uh, DEI, I've, I've noticed all of those things are definitely uh, converging right now. And yeah. there's definitely an opportunity here to move humanity in the right direction. So I, I like that. Um, tell, tell us a little bit more about the success, the STEM Success Summit that you run, what that's about, how often you do it. Um, what, what are some details around that? Yeah, the STEM Success Summit is our flagship annual event, conference type event, where we bring together two to 3,000 individuals in our community and provide them with multiple days of workshops and networking and scholarships and opportunities to advance their career um, mm -hmm. and their personal development. Uh, that being said, it was founded about four years ago. Uh, me and my partner, Justin Schaefer, at the time, got together and ideated a way to have, get this, a virtual conference. No one had ever heard about it at the time. Now, this was pre-COVID. We were ahead of the curve in many ways. It was 2019. We held our first one. That was November 2019. And what do you know? The next year, everybody was having virtual conferences. And so finding ourselves already having our feet wet, we were to host another one, and that next one was even better. I mean, we doubled our attendance from year one to year two. Got some pretty nice star power, right, for our keynotes. Great. Um, because people were more available. Um, and then the year three, last year, 2022, I'm sorry, 2021, uh, we also did the same thing. Leveled up our attendance, uh, expanded our reach. So now being three years in, with the, the worst of COVID behind us, we're looking to have a... Um, hybrid experience this year really not only, yeah it not only has you know, in person component as we have but yeah we want to have a small here's what we're calling it we're calling the in-person people who come in person the vip experience I like so it. Uh, we'll have a different price point for that but there we'll have opportunities for people to make individual pitches um we'll be able to network at it with a deeper engagement right because we're not just uh in breakout rooms um, and then we also look to have some special sponsorship activation there that we couldn't quite have online. So still have it online, right? Our three days of webinars sure. you can sign up for, a low barrier of entry for our reach, but then our in-person VIP experience to allow us to have, uh, you know, an added component uh, up in the ante, if you will, of what we're able to provide our community. I like it. Is there anyone else doing this? Are you the, you're, it seems like you're, you're the only one doing this. <laughs> No, no. I, I mean, there are a lot of great people out there. I mean, a lot of great uh, organizations, obviously, that are doing things. You know, NSBE, uh, the National Society of Black Engineers is what they're known as. Uh, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, another. They're, they're very hybrid with their events. But, you know, we like we take pride in the fact that we are grassroots in many ways. Right. We work with people who are uh, influencers on, you know, social media. They're, they hmm. have built their profiles being known and recognized as you know, your female engineer, as one of our friends says, or the people engineer or engineering memes guy. Like we, we bring these folks together, right, and try to make sure that what we put on feels more authentic and it's more grassroots and it doesn't come across as some big entity, some big, you know, institution that's saying, here's what you all need. But rather, we can decide what we need and then we can we can partner with with corporations and sponsors that want to uh, be a part of what we're already doing. That's great. Yeah. I, I've tried to do that same thing because I know, you know, when it does get a little more corporate, it feels mm -hmm. a little bit more out of a touch and you right. lose, you can't lose that personal touch. Exactly. You know, someone in the trenches that's slugged it through <laughs> and gone through those challenges with you. Sure so sure um, speaking of challenges, you are a civil engineer. Yes. Or, you know, and I know people that listen to this, at least on our our podcast and channel are typically, you know, civil engineers are looking into going into civil engineering at some mm -hmm. level. Um, do you have any tips that you could share for someone that may be venturing into this world of civil engineering, whether it's college or career? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, what challenges did you face that you noticed, uh, especially being, you know, black as an underrepresented group? 
what -hmm. challenges did you see that way too? Um, So people, I guess, get the the whole picture when you're coming to this and maybe some tools that they could use to combat Mm -hmm. the, anything that comes their way. Yeah, I'll answer in two ways for sure. I'll answer technically first. Of course, civil engineering, as you go deeper into a field, you realize that what originally felt like a narrow, you know, niche of a career is still broad and so many different options. So within civil engineering, I was in structures, right? Structural engineering. And then even within structures, you got your vertical structures, your buildings, you have your horizontal structures, your your bridges, which is what I did. But mm-hmm. even in that, you know, your transportation structure, you got your culverts your tunnels, right? There's towers, right? There's so much, right? That goes into being in civil engineering, even as a structural engineer. So I would say that from a technical standpoint, you know, really hone in on what you want to work on. You will find that something as simple as like different software, drafting software is different depending on what type of projects you're working on. Um, So, you know, really trying to make sure you understand that even though you may have done one thing and it was a civil engineering opportunity, that another thing in civil engineering could be vastly different. And so when you're doing that, I'll speak from my experience, you know, you want to make sure you have your geometry on deck. You you get that, you get those trig functions ready to like, uh, you know, pull up at a a moment's notice. You make sure you have your, you know, your arc tangents and your your curves and, all. you know, your go-to references for when you're actually trying to calculate things technically. So I'll say that's that and that'll help you tremendously as you go forth and try to get your EIN or pass the FE, Fundamental Engineering. And then eventually your PE, uh, which was a beast. We talked about this a little bit offline, but yeah, that PE is a beast. And I know you all help people with that. So this is a tremendous resource. And so I'll say that definitely technically speaking. Awesome. Um, the, the other thing, here's the thing. And if I'm just to be honest with you, man, it's being, when it comes to being a black male in the space, mm-hmm. um, it is almost impossible to shake the reality, not even just the feeling of, you in some ways representing, you know, so many more people, because sometimes when people don't know a lot of people like you in a space, they infer a lot in their mind about the group of people from you. Hmm. So what that means is if you are making mistakes or if you're not easy, easy to work with, uh, whether it's just you or not, people can sometimes assume that that's how everybody is like you. Um, conversely, it could be the same way when you're doing good. Um, but here's the thing. We're not in the vacuum. So All when right. things happen, you know, and on the news, for instance, when you know, George Floyd and those things take place, you know, you still go to the office in which you're the only person that may have, you know, such a close touch point in the personal feeling of what has taken place. And what may feel like now normal casual conversation with your colleagues can be something that really strikes a nerve with you. And so you really got to get used to mm. um, being that that individual that in many ways represents, you know, your entire community. Um, I don't think it's fair, but it, but it is what it is to be completely honest with you. Um, other right. things, other things, yeah, that nature just, you know, really include, um, <laughs> you know, occasionally being mistaken as someone that doesn't belong somewhere, hmm. uh, whether you're walking in to work late or walking out to your, working out to your parking lot, you know, by your cars and hearing the, you know, the doors lock. I don't know, you know, you worked there forever. Just different stuff like that, right? And I, I'm not one to continue to dwell on that, but it's real. It's real. And for some reason, you know, it takes, you know, bigger things to get an ear bent your way, right? When you try right. to mean it. Um, but nevertheless, you know, you have to get to a point to where you are committed to doing good work. You're committed to doing good work. And that ultimately, You control what you can control. You hold yourself accountable. Yes, there is also accountability of society. You hold yourself accountable as well as the fact being willing to speak up when it's time for you to do so. I mean, what you described is very interesting to me. And um, I'm curious, like, did the pressure of that, like representing everybody, because you're probably the only black guy in the office Mm -hmm. and when society does have events like this, you know, you know, people want to talk to you yeah. most likely about stuff. Right. And you're, and is there a, a certain degree of pressure that you're like, I didn't, I don't want to, I didn't want to deal with this. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I want to come here and do my career because most engineers that I know, they want to come in, you know, they want to go to their cubicle or whatever it is. They want to do their work. 
you know, and sometimes they just want to go home. Yeah. But you get this added pressure of events that are happening in the world. Sure. Did, did that pressure, I mean, does that, did that ever get to you personally? I mean, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it feels more pressure before you're able to get to a point, or at least for myself, before I was able to get to a point of saying, I'm not going to put the pressure on me myself. There you go. I have to always speak up, to always have to make sure things are right. And, or if I do speak up, I'm still speaking on behalf of myself to from one experience. Mm. And I don't have to give people the impression that just speaking to me is enough. Because it's one of these things where it's like, yeah, I definitely want to do a good job. Sometimes I don't want to have the conversation. But also that doesn't mean the conversation doesn't need to be had. Right. You know what I mean? So it is refreshing when, you know, you come across individuals and allies, as we refer at times, who who want to become more acquainted may take the cue from you. All right, let me not try to press any mind on this or make it his job to educate me. But maybe I'm going to speak up right in another circle or I'm going to go take initiative to educate myself outside of just the one black guy that I know. Yeah. <laughs> having uh, to do it. And so, yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's like. Yes, the pressure was there. Then I began to give myself permission to not have to perform. But that also happens in conjunction with the fact that, oh, very much so the conversation still needs to be had and very much so people still need to speak up, even if I'm not at a given moment, you know, up to doing so. Right. Makes sense. Thanks for sharing that with us. I think that's sure. stuff that we need to hear. So that's that's good stuff. Sure. Um, jumping back a little bit to the engineering side of stuff. Yeah. Um, people struggle with these PE. They struggle with the FE. <laughs> Many people fail and even sometimes fail classes, you know. Uh, do you have any tips when people do struggle, they they fail or they have to repeat stuff? Do you, do you have any tips around the maybe this fear of failure and getting back and training again? Yeah, yeah. So here I have some tips and I'm going to speak to, it's probably not going to be everybody because I know you got a lot of people you help, but it's going, I know it's going to be, it's going to be a few people out there that need to hear this. And that mm. is let go of your pride, let go of your mm. pride. Um, and the reason why I say so is because I actually used to do pretty well in math classes and I passed the FE on the first try, right? Nice. PE was a totally different story. Right. But what happened was I developed some sort of like, you know, overconfidence at times. And I didn't do things as if there were some more points in saying, oh, I didn't have to take a course or I didn't need to bring all my references with me or I didn't even need to study the whole thing. And I still did well. Well, when I started to fail, part of me was just like not wanting to have to do the extra work. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to study that hard for the FE. Why should I have to do all this extra studying for the PE, you know? <laughs> or I didn't have to do so much when I took this class why do I have to spend all this time now? And oftentimes it's the pride. It's the oh, pride of saying, what if I do all this and I still fail? Everything I know about myself or I believe to be about myself might be questioned. And it's like, no, nah, do, do what it takes. Right. So one of the differences that made it, many of the difference for me was me going from saying, I have a PhD, I passed the FP without failing ever. And let me just take the test, right? Which didn't work out well to like, all right, let me enroll in the course. <laughs> let me get an accountability partner. Let me make a checklist where I literally hit every single topical area uh, <laughs> that I know is going to be on the exam. And at that point, then I can say that I gave you my best shot. But until then, it's just my pride. Yep. No, I think there are plenty that need to hear that. Um, yeah. You know, running courses, I do get to see a lot of different sides of people. And I can usually tell when people got the pride thing going on, when yeah. everything is a problem or they... <laughs> scrutinize every little thing and it's it's kind of like they um maybe they went and took the exam and and some people struggle with just the, the whole process like right, they're, right, right they're right. mad at the N ncs for yeah. how, they, how they test yeah you know and how they do it and it's just like i get it but you know you gotta do drop you gotta that do. right <laughs> do what you gotta do do what you gotta do okay yeah. you may be right but uh don't let that stand in the way of you doing what you gotta do exactly Sweet. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Well, um, I know you guys came out with a new course. Tell, tell me a little bit about that as we kind of 
you know, wrap this thing up, but tell us a little bit about your uh, course you guys just developed over there. Stem. Yeah, yeah. So our most recent uh, masterclass or premium course, again, did it with a partner of mine, uh, Justin Schaefer, is it's called Present for Profit Public Speaking for People in STEM. And, you know, I, I've always had the, I would say at least the ability to speak publicly. I didn't always like it, didn't always volunteer to do it. But over time, as I began to embrace it, you know, I kind of realized that not everybody that are in our line of work, you know, find it natural to get up and speak or uh, beneficial. Or some people really oh, are. Uh, it's right up there with that, death. They are oh, come on now. I mean, people, some people would rather die. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's up there. Right. Um, and so there's a huge opportunity and a huge um, value proposition for our profession to help people learn how to better speak how to better communicate. And then, hey, those who might even have doors open for them to do it as a side hustle or an advancement to their career and bring in more job opportunities, by all means, we want to make sure we we unlock that for people. And so oh, we yeah. did, we, were, we just released this course, Public Speaking. A Present for Profit is the, it's the formal name, but it's a public speaking course for people in STEM. We go from everything from how to craft your presentation, how to make sure you're you know, your data and your technical information isn't all stale, how to work with clients, how to sometimes even book paid gigs outside of your day job to make sure that you can continue to expand your message and level up as a communicator. And uh, we're really excited about it because people are responding and really verifying the fact that, oh, no, this is an issue. I've been actually wondering about this for a while. Thank you so much. Right. For creating this public speaking course for people in STEM. And so if people are interested in that, they can definitely go to stemmedia.com slash courses. That's how you get to a lot of our content. But stemmedia.com slash courses right now is promoting that course. And uh, we're still we're still in the phase where we have uh, kind of a discount pricing. I don't know when people go listen to this, but uh, I'll say it this way. As as one uh, rapper once said, yesterday's price is not today's price. And so uh, <laughs> definitely if you're interested in this, I definitely say go ahead and check that out. I like it. I'm interested in that myself, man. This, that, that, you got good stuff there. Yeah, that's Thank really, you. really good stuff. We'll uh, make sure we link all that um, in the notes and get that blasted away for you as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, well, this has been really enjoyable. Thanks for jumping on with me, Dr. Nee. It's been really fun to, to have this chat with you. Mm -hmm. uh, any last piece, pieces of wisdom you got rolling around in that head? You know, I, I'll say that quote, and I didn't come up with it. It's from a, a motivational speaker, Dr. Eric Thomas, who says, you have to take advantage of the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of that opportunity. Um, some people recognize their gifts, their talents, their opportunities that they've been um, allowed access to and things of that nature. But it's not going to last forever, right? Nothing lasts forever. Your children aren't going to be that age forever. You're not going to have, you know, those coworkers forever. You're not going to always be in this stage of life that you're in now. Yeah, that so if there are opportunities, yeah, if there's something in front of you to take advantage of, take advantage of these opportunities of a lifetime while there's still lifetime in that opportunity. And so I'll leave on that. I love it. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, as we wrap up, where can yes. people connect with you? Where, where can they connect with you, see more about you? Should we... You want to jump yeah. to the website, LinkedIn, sure. or something? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I'll say my personal website, nehemiahmabry.com. You can go there. Um, if you want to book me to speak, I'll be happy to do that. Um, but even more so, stemmedia.com slash connect. And you can see all the stuff that we're putting out on a regular basis. Again, that's stemmedia, S-T-E-M-E-D-I-A, stemmedia, one word with one M, dot com slash uh, connect. And you can see a number of things we got going on, both both free and also that require investment. And we'll love to see you on the inside of that. Love it. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for doing this. Um, yeah. We'll connect in the future. Thanks for jumping Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Have All a right. good one. See you.